coming. Uh, <clears throat> I was last here about five years ago, I think. Uh, maybe none of you were, so <laughs> it was a different program. Um, I uh, wasn't here last week, uh, so my only clue about kind of what everyone's background is is from Aravind's talk. Uh, he sent me his slides. So I'm assuming that um, motivic homotopy theory is at least uh, somewhere in your toolbox. And, uh, but if I get going too fast, uh, go ahead and slow me down. <clears throat> so I want to talk about a problem of um, about vector bundles. So I'm, I'm going to suppose x is a smooth affine variety. And um, I want to talk about, and let, let's suppose it's over the complex numbers. <clears throat> and the question is, um, the basic question is, uh, is how to construct or how to classify, how to construct algebraic vector bundles on X. <clears throat> and this is a hard problem, uh, and I want to give a partial answer, or an answer in a, in a, in a specific case, or a specific class of cases. And the, this question, I, I know in Aravind's talk, he talked a little bit about uh, the origin of studying algebraic vector bundles. Um, so I won't, I'm not going to give a huge background. But, um, but vector bundles over affine varieties, those are, finitely, those are projective modules over the affine coordinate ring. And there are, largely aren't general tools for writing down projective modules. I mean, all you can do is write down a big matrix and look for a projection operator. Um, there were examples, early examples due to Swan, um, mod looking at uh, algebraic versions of the sphere. And in those examples, Swan was able to produce things like projective modules that aren't free and all kinds of things like that. Like the connection with topology, uh, kind of grew significantly. There was Sayre's work uh, on, there was Sayre's work uh, 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 and Sayre's conjectures. And um, anyway, there's many things in that, in that, in that world. Um, uh, another person that got interested in this in the 1970s was Phil Griffiths. Griffiths wanted to prove the Hodge conjecture Hodge conjecture is to show that every cohomology class on a, on a smooth variety or smooth affine variety uh, of a certain type, everything of Hodge type, is represented by an algebraic cycle. And probably the main obstruction to understanding that is that we don't really know what cohomology classes are. But rationally, every cohomology class occurs as the churn class of a vector bundle. And we do know what vector bundles are. And so Griffiths was really, he, he really wanted to investigate the problem of, uh, of building affine, building vector bundles over affine varieties. And so a related question, and this is why I'm working over C, is uh, when is a topological vector bundle vector bundle on, let me write it like this. So this will just be the underlying analytic space, and this will be the variety, uh, algebraic. So when does that have an algebraic structure? <clears throat> um, so I'm not going to solve this problem in general. <laughs> That would prove the Hodge conjecture, but I, I'm going to, um, I want to give you, uh, oh, oh, I should have said right at the beginning, everything in this talk is joint work with, uh, with um, Aravind, Ashok, and Tom Bachman. All right. So I'm going to give you a general class of, uh, of varieties on which we can answer this question. And uh, um, so let me get to that in a second. 
But let me talk a little bit, before I get into that, I want to say a little tiny bit about what Griffith's, was, Griffith's idea. So Griffiths wanted to think of, so a vector bundle is given by a map to the Grassmannian of k planes in n space for, n, for some n sufficiently large. And this might, map might merely be a continuous map, and we want to know if we can make it algebraic. So by Grauer's Oka principle, when x is affine, you can assume this map is holomorphic, And you want to know, can you make it algebraic? And Griffiths was motivated by these classic theorems in complex analysis, like the theorems of Picard, that tell you um, if you have a map to P1, you can measure how far it is from being algebraic by counting the num by picking a point, um, say x here let's call this f, and look and counting the number of points, uh, the number, or let's call this y, the number of solutions to f of x equals y, where the absolute value of x is less than some r. And this is some, think of this as some function of r. <clears throat> so if f is polynomial, then this function is constant. As r gets large, it remains constant. If it's e to a polynomial of degree d, then this function grows like r to the d. And um, you can study, you can measure how far a, an algebra, a holomorphic function is from being algebraic by counting the distribution of its values or the number of solutions to this kind of equation. There's also these famous theorems that it, um, it can miss at most three points and things like this. And this is all a part of a chapter in complex analysis called value distribution theory. And what Griffiths wanted to do was to set up a higher dimensional analog of that when you have a holomorphic map to a Grassmannian. You replace P1 by a Grassmannian and C by some X. And you could write down uh, general solutions like this. You could write down a general uh, expression like this. In fact, let me, um, let me, um, <clears throat> oh, I have to watch the time. Oh, yeah. I remember these boards. It's over here. Yeah, I see. Oh, I see. This will work. Okay. On the side. Oh, just tighten it. And then you fl they flip over, right, when you're done and you, yes, okay, okay. Okay, so what happens here, we want to replace a point by a subvariety, and we somehow want to measure the volume of f inverse of z intersect um, some, you have to, there's, you know, there's some auxiliary choices you have to make. You have to choose what's called an exhaustion function on x, but some way of exhausting it by compact domains, and you look at the volume of this as a function of r. And, you'd, um, and then you'd like to sort of be able to filter between holomorphic and algebraic functions by doing that. And Griffith's program didn't work in the end. There was some there was a Cornalba and somebody else found a counterexample to one of the fundamental things that they were hoping was true, and the whole program kind of ran aground. But I, I want to sort of, I think the theorem I'm talking about today, I, I think tells you that it's worth revisiting and that there's probably something more one can do. <clears throat> okay, so let me, I just want to get kind of off the ground here. I know I'm taking a long time to do it. Uh, let's look at this for a minute. So one thing is that every cycle in the Grassmannian, because we know the Chow group, every cycle uh, corresponds, you know, is, is rationally equivalent to sort of a co-product of Schubert cycles. And the Schubert cycles, those are telling us what the churn classes of this vector bundle are. So if, 
if the churn classes themselves are algebraic, in other words, if the restriction of this, if, if every, every cycle is rationally equivalent to something where this, is, this, is, this looks finite, then you, then, then you would expect, if this growth rate stuff worked, that every, that once the, you, well, anyway, let me just say, it leads to the following expectation. That if the churn classes of B are algebraic, then V is algebraic. <laughs> F. Yeah, sure. F classifies V. Or yeah, I mean, but V was arbitrary, so yeah, sorry. So F classifying V. Okay. It leads to this, it leads to this, Griffiths never came out and said this, and I don't think it was, uh, uh, but if you kind of start thinking through this, it sets up this expectation. But this expectation is false. Um, so there's a counterexample you can construct. It's a, an open, it's the complement of a hypersurface in P1 cross P3 uh, that has algebraic and a vector bundle, a rank two vector bundle with algebraic churn classes, uh, but the vector bundle itself is not algebraic. So that relies, that's an exploitation of one of Bert Totaro's counterexamples to the integer Hodge conjecture, and it appears in a paper of uh, Aravind. Um, <clears throat> myself and John Fossil. Uh, I, I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to explain any more about that, but I'll just tell you that this is false. <clears throat> so I want to move away from the Hodge conjecture. And so now, I, what is the thing? Can I, should I just flip this over or erase the boards, or does anybody care? Nobody flipped it? Okay. I was really looking forward to flipping that board, but uh, <laughs> I, ha I practiced. I ha no, okay, so, um, okay, so, all right, so, so this is false, and, uh, and I think it's interesting in the light, in, if we're going to look for what, what else could have been added to this structure? We want to try to go from, rash, from churn classes. So we need a mechanism to go from churn classes. Or I'm sorry. Well, let, me, let me pause for a minute. That's false. OK. <clears throat> so let me state the main theorem now. And then, we'll, and then, I'll, uh, and then I'll move on. OK, so, so let me make a definition. Let's say, so now I want to talk, oh, all right, I need, so B is going to, all right, so let's see. So let's let SP be the category of motivic spaces. Over C, and, I'll, and I have a, a motivic space, we'll be, let's say it's even cellular. If it's motive, if it's motive is pure Tate. So that's the sum of Z tensor S to N alpha N, or N's ranging in some indexing set. So sorry, I just jumped way ahead into a different uh, a different level of sophistication, and I, I'm not sure if this notation is, is common or familiar to people. Is this okay? So this takes place in Voivodsky's category DM, and this is the motive. Okay, so examples of this. 
examples of this are um, Pn So that's just the sum as i goes from 0 to n of z tensor s to n n. And um, the Grassmannian of k planes in n space is another example. And um, there's many, many more examples. If you take the limit, let's take the, the classifying space for BGLn. That's another example that's not a variety. <clears throat> OK. <laughs> now, we are interested in affine varieties. Well, let me, let me state the theorem then. So the theorem, due to um, Asa, Ashok, Bachman, and me and myself, is that if x is affine and cellular smooth affine, then, um, then the algebraic vector bundles on x. So there's a map given an algebraic vector bundle of rank k on x. I can get a topological vector bundle of rank k on the underlying analytic space, that this map is a bijection. So, uh, so if, there, if it's affine cellular, then, uh, yeah, then every topological vector bundle has an algebraic structure. Now, if we look back at the examples I gave, you'll see that um, none of these examples uh, are anything the theorem applies to, because these aren't affine varieties. But you can, but you, but you can replace those by homotopy equivalent affine varieties. And so if we call Pn tilde the space of projection operators, um, of rank 1, then Pn tilde is homotopy equivalent to Pn. This is affine. I've described it by affine equations there. And it's even and cellular. And I could do the space of rank k projection operators and get an affine model for the Grassmannian. So there's lots of, so this doesn't apply to projective varieties. That's a whole different story. But it does apply to smooth affine varieties. So I want to explain a little bit about this proof uses a lot of stuff, and I want to give you a bit of a tour of what goes into this proof. But um, before I do, let me just make a philosophical point that <clears throat> Griffith's stuff, Griffith was ultimately, oh, I've erased it now, but Griffith was looking at complex function theory and trying to compute, uh, the, trying to com interpolate between holomorphic and algebraic functions by looking at growth rate. And that's, that's ultimately, uh, it's a mix. It's about local conditions and functions. If you're doing something function theoretic and you're trying to put, do things with functions, you're trying to understand smooth varieties locally. Now, being smooth is a local property. The, um, our condition, this condition here, these homo is a homotopy theoretic condition, and it's global. It asks that there's just no bad cycles on your variety, that everything looks, every cycle, that every homology class comes from an algebraic cycle, and there's no, I mean, it's as, it's as nice a situation as you can be. <clears throat> and I think this, trying to bring these together is, an, is, a, is a fascinating problem. And it, back in the days, in the, in, uh, in the sort of 70s, and when manifold theory was undergoing all this rev revolution, Sullivan tried to approach this problem of trying to say, you know, what is a, trying to define, get at what a manifold is into a homotopy theoretic, a homotopy theoretic mix of local and global properties. And I'm bringing, this will come up a little bit later in my talk, but I, I think this is something that we, we're starting to get, come closer to understanding. And um, there's been a lot of work on it. I, 
uh, I know Fabian has done a lot of work and Aravind and others, but um, I think we're still, the, 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 an analogous situation of understanding kind of from the point of view of motivic homotopy theory, what a smooth affine variety is in terms of homotopy theoretic data is, is a really fascinating problem. And uh, I think what, trying to bring these two points of view together, I think is, is, gets us a little closer to that. Okay, so let me move on and, um, and tell you a little bit about uh, what goes into this. So, okay. <clears throat> I think I'm down here. <clears throat> Okay, so, so the first thing, the first, so I wanna, I wanna explain a little bit about what goes into this proof. So the first thing that goes into this is this amazing uh, affine representability result. So this is a theorem originally due to Fabian Morel uh, and it, it was one of these theorems, this happens a lot, this, this was like such a reach. When Fabian first proved this, it, was, it used everything in the subject. And, uh, and it was in a, you know, making it kind of the most ambitious thing one could reach. And, uh, and as people studied it and studied it and kind of thought about different aspects of it, a substantially uh, uh, simpler proof was found by uh, Ashok, uh, Mark Oywa, and Matthias Bent. And that says that, um, that algebraic vector bundles, that if X is smooth affine, then algebraic vector bundles on X up to isomorphism is the same thing as uh, homotopy classes of maps from X into B, G, L, K. And so this is, hom this is motivic homotopy classes of maps, or A1 homotopy classes of maps. Now this is a, I mean, this is a fantastic result, and it brings all kinds of amazing new techniques into, um, into studying algebraic vector bundles. And the, one of the things it does is it decomposes this problem in a way, in a completely new way, a way that's very difficult to see from the point of view of algebra. And remember, the algebraic problem is writing down a projective module over the coordinate ring or writing down a projection operator on, on, some, on, on a free module over the affine coordinate ring. But it, what it brings, it brings to you an approximation that goes from the cohomology of X with coefficients in the homotopy sheaves of BGLN and converges to uh, the set of rank N, rank K vector bundles on X. No. Oh, you're right. I thought you, this was the too many ends. No, but these are supposed to be the same end. Anyway, yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, so that, uh, so what this does, so these objects, these homotopy sheaves are, they're brand new objects and, in, and Fabian introduced, uh, computed many of these and introduced fundamental new algebraic uh, invariants. And it's very challenging to relate these to classical algebraic invariants. If, uh, in terms of the problem of, uh, of projective modules. Um, okay. <clears throat> and I just want to compare this. If this hadn't been motivic, if we'd been, in fact, I won't, I won't write this down, but if instead of, ta you know, we're taking the, this, this infinity category of, of pre-sheaves of simplicial sets on smooth affines, and then we're Nisnevich localizing and A1 localizing, and if we hadn't A, A1 localized, this theorem would be trivial, but all you would learn here is that vector bundles is H1 with coefficients in GLN. 
So this, this affine representability theorem is extremely powerful and it com it's, a, it, it's a complete game changer for studying these. Okay, <clears throat> well, but let's get back to where, what we were thinking. We, were, we wanted to go, right? I wanted to, to sort of go back to where this counterexample was and go from churn classes to vector bundles. So where are churn classes here? So the nth churn class of V, or th that's in H2NN of, of X, which is homotopy classes of maps from X into the Voivodsky's KZ of N, 2N. <clears throat> and a question comes up, so maybe we're willing to give ourselves something about this. And when something is even and cellular, you have, I'll, I'm going to spell this out in a minute. When something's even and cellular, you, this is something you've, you've got complete control over. And so if we're going to try to imagine how we might get from, uh, if we're, if, if, if we're going to imagine that we're willing to start with an assumption about these kind of cohomology groups, what will that ultimately tell us about BGLN? I'm sorry? I still, I'm sorry, I couldn't. The rank is K. And N was just, N was a number, I'm, a letter I'm using too often. So, all right, so, so a question emerges, which is um, how can we get from k c of n to n to b g l k. Now, <clears throat> um, sorry. so I should have said, so what's the topological analog? So in topology, this is fairly easy. The question is going from k z to n to be GLK, and in topology, this is, this is a relatively easy thing to do because you can use the Posnikov tower so the Posnikov tower resolves BGLK, or this is BGLK of C, I guess if we're in topology. It resolves that into um, k, well, this happens also algebraically, pi n of BGLK uh, n's, okay? But in topology, pi n is an abelian group and I can write it and I can resolve it in, in terms of Z. Just by taking a free resolution or something. So this spectral sequence comes from the Posnikov tower of BGLK and motivic homotopy, but it resolves it in terms of island or McLean spaces associated to homotopy sheaves that we can't necessarily build out of these. So, so there's, a, there's a sort of the question of trying to go from an assumption about churn classes to, an assumption, to something about BGLN uh, has to do with a non-trivial problem in motivic homotopy theory of can you build BGLK out of these particular island or McLean spaces? All right. <clears throat> Okay, so, so I want to start with something that, uh, so when, you're, when you face something like this, you don't, I don't know how to build BGL, so that's a question. Can we, can we go from these kind of spaces to BGLK? And the, the, the question is, um, <clears throat> is uh, 
or, or the, the, sta the standard approach to something like this is just to, to start with things that you know you can build and then hope that as you add to that list, you find you've eventually added, uh, added this thing to that list. So let me first start with um, in motivic spectra. Okay, I'm going to ask, so now I'm going to work in the stable homotopy category. This will be motivic spectra. And I'm going to look at the MGL, the analog of the complex cobordism spectrum, the Tom spectrum of the universal, uh, of the universal uh, <coughs> vector bundle over BGL. And this thing, so the associated grade, so the slice filtration of this has associated graded. a big sum of Z tensor S2M M for M in some indexing set. And so this is, uh, sometimes this is called the theorem of Hopkins and Morel, and it probably would be published as a joint paper of Hopkins and Morel, except um, I, uh, I don't know. I caused us somehow to not write that up. And uh, every time I get a chance to, I apologize for Fabian for it. And every time I look at him to see if he's forgiven me yet. <laughs> I'm so happy I came here today. Anyway, Mark Oywa wrote up a, a, a proof of it and kindly attributed it to us. And uh, so anyway, this is a theorem I like a lot and I like to use it a lot. But this tells me that the zero space this tells me that the zero space is a product of k z of m 2 m <clears throat> and more generally i can take mgl tensor S 2M, 2, 2NN, and that, the zero space of that, I mean, this will just shift all of these, so that'll also be the product of K, Z of M, 2M. <laughs> and even more generally, if, um, if B is even cellular, then MGL tensor B is a, is a sum of M G L tensor S two M M. It's a sum of those, uh, and uh, and therefore it's zero space. So any space that comes to us as the zero space of an of MGL tensor something even cellular is, is just, it's not just built out of these, it's, it is, it is these, it is isomorphic to uh, a product of these. Now in topology, there's this fantastic theorem that appeared in the 1970s in the thesis of Steve Wilson. Uh, topology, and that says that the zero space of S2N tensor MU, so this is in topology, that this um, ha is even cellular in topology. So this has only, has a cell decomposition with only even cells. So this is a hard theorem, uh, and it uses hard, there's lots of different approaches to it, um, but they all use hard calculations in terms of uh, uh, the cohomology of Eilenberg maclean spaces. And since the 70s, people have been looking for um, a better proof of this. Uh, uh, I think what people had in mind was that one is able to describe this kind of space in geometric terms that makes it obvious that it has 
uh, an even cell decomposition. So uh, many years ago, or about 10 years ago, kind of in collaboration with Mike Hill and conversations with Aravind, uh, we formulated something we called the Wilson space hypothesis, which was that the analog of this would be true in motivic homotopy theory. And that's a theorem, uh, which is, so it's due to um, Bachman and myself. And that says that, um, so, and that says that after profinite completion, Uh, the zero space of, uh, of uh, MGL tensor S2MN is even cellular. And I'd like to, uh, so this is, in the end, the proof we found is just, it's, it's the analog of the way Ravenel, Wilson originally proved the theorem and the way Ravenel and Wilson subsequently kind of better package that proof. But so the proof, the proof uses a, uh, a, a computation of uh, Duda, um, Bachman, and myself. Of the cohomology. Let me may say P at uh, A B C D, and there's no more good letters. M N for certain values of uh, of M and N with mod P coefficients. So we calculate this in a range. I think n has to be greater than or equal to, uh, to 2m minus 1. Um, so I'm not going to describe this. I'll just say what the answer is. That, um, in the, so Voivodsky constructed certain Steenrod operations uh, that, 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 that raised the cohomology and changed the weight. These were famously you know, this famous input into his proof of the Milner conjecture. And way back then in the 90s, uh, um, Mark Levine and I and uh, Steve Lichtenbaum and Tom Goodwillie ran a seminar going through that. And, uh, and Mark explained to me, I didn't understand any of this at the time, that what was really remarkable was Voiv about Voivodsky's, that there were obvious Steenrod operations that just changed topological degree the way they do in topology and don't change the weight. And that what was really significant about Voivodsky's Steenrod operations is that they did change the weight. And it turns out that, if you, that the Voivodsky Steenrod operations just give you some parts of the cohomology. And if you want the rest, you just have to put in the, the, the ones Mark called the obvious ones, the ones that don't change the weight. And um, so this is, this, this is a, kind of using kind of clever formulations due to Ravenel and Wilson, this is, this turns out, this isn't a significant, this isn't a super hard result. Um, and I'm not going to say what it is, but I just want you to know that what was missing in, in trying to write all this down were the things that we already, already knew about. And something like this was conjectured by uh, Bert Guillou and Chuck Weibel. But uh, anyway, the proof uses this and it uses, uh, and then it builds, it uses the, um, anyway, it builds MGL out of eilenberg maclean spaces using this, this result here and tracks what's happening in cohomology. And then you're able to prove that this is even cellular. <laughs> okay, I'm supposed to stop at half past the hour. Is that the thing? All right. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so that's, that's what goes into this Wilson space hypothesis. It's this, I mean, the, it's, there's a lot. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's mainly this calculation of the, 
of the, the cohomology of Eilenberg McLean spaces. <clears throat> but then all the sophisticated tools of Ravenel and Wilson. Okay, so now look, that lets you do something, okay? Let's start with BGLK, which we don't know anything about, but we can, um, we can suspend it and we can go to MGL tensor BGLK and then we can take the zero space and we get a map and now we know this thing is a product this thing is a product of KZ of n's 2n and it's also even cellular this was merely even cellular this is a product of these and even cellular and so I can just repeat I can, I can suspend this. Uh-oh, I didn't leave myself enough room. It's like, so here. Okay, and once again, this was even cellular, so this is a product of these, and it's also even cellular, and you can just continue. So this gives some kind of, so this gives a resolution of BGLK in terms of of these motivic Eilenberg McLean spaces. <clears throat> so that's good. That uses, well, it uses what I've told you, and it gives me a resolution. But, um, but now we want to we want to know that's good for computing. We'd like to know we could calculate maps into here by mapping into all of these things, which ultimately expresses is given by maps into these Eilenberg McLean spaces. And the um, so we need to know. That this, that, that this process converges. So we would need to know convergence. Hmm. So, um, uh, I'm sorry, I got screwed up. Uh, I think this, I'm gonna put Aravind's name here and because this, this, this is all part of the same story. So the, um, the, the, so now we need, we need to know that this is convergent. So, the, so let me just, just to keep it simple, let's call this cosimplicial diagram over here, capital I, and the theorem, theorem, <clears throat> theorem is that, um, again, this is after profinite completion, that, uh, that uh, B, G, L, K into this homotopy limit of I is an equivalence. It's an isomorphism in the infinity category of motivic spaces, or a, a, ho a weak homotopy equivalence. <clears throat> So that means you can calculate maps into BGLK in terms of this, in terms of these KZ of n two n's. Now, this convergence argument this uses the motivic Freudenthal theorem. And I don't know, uh, is that, is Aravind here yet? Yes. Are you talking about that? A little bit. Okay. Um, I was going to save myself some time by not stating it. Um, what's that? Okay. So um, for the moment, 
the most particular statement of the motivic Freudian thought theorem is what, when we were children, we would say is for me to know and you to find out. And uh, you get to find out in Aravind's talk, which I think is maybe next. So I won't, I won't say that, I won't state the motivic Freudian thought theorem today, but I'll tell you, it, it approximates unstable homotopy by stable homo motivic homotopy in a controlled range of dimensions. And ultimately, that's what you're trying to do here. These are, this is something unstable and this is something stable and you need to know something about the connectivity of this map. It's not that simple, there's a lot more, there's a lot more to deducing this from the motivic Freudenthal theorem. Um, I wanted to get at this theorem and kind of uh, ruminate on it a little bit because it's another place. So the, the original Freudenthal suspension theorem, it was proved, it was, it was a general position argument. It was proved in the context of manifolds. It was proved by writing maps from a space to loops on its suspension or loop, you know, maps into a loop space in terms of cobordism of manifolds, and it was a, a general position argument. Sayer came up with another argument, this beautiful induction argument, but it used, it used properties of the circle. It used the fact that the circle was a quotient of R. It used the path loop vibration. And one way or another, you can't really escape something about the Freudenthal theorem, it, it, if you think of these motivic spaces as built out of some motivic material, and you know, we're trying to understand that material in homotopy theoretic terms, and you might say Griffiths was trying to understand that material in complex analytic terms, that, that one way or another, you have to use something about this kind of the mot whatever this mysterious mo material is that builds motivic spaces. And this proof of the motivic Freudenthal, it, it's like Fabian's original proof of the uh, affine representability. It just, we just have hit it with everything in the subject. And it still hasn't quite emerged what are the most key in ingredients, but one of the things that, that, that one thing that goes into this uh, is very important in this is um, Mark Levine's work on the homotopy Coniveau Tower. And I think what, what emerges here, the things that emerge here is that motivic material, the only, the only clues we have about it now are the, um, the Roche-Schmidt kind of resolutions that Fabian's pioneered the use of, which gives everything a cell decomposition over possibly bigger fields, and Marx, uh, and all this stuff about the homotopy Coniveau tower. So, I don't know, I just, since I brought up this thing about what is motivic homotopy material, uh, when I talked about Griffith stuff, I wanted to just point out that I think we also really kind of confronted that question in trying to formulate and prove the motivic Freudenthal theorem, but I, we don't have, have a good, have an answer yet. I think we just have a sense of what we just have a sense of what the important f features are. <clears throat> okay, so, oh, all right. And so I've got 10 minutes left. I wanted to, I wanted to say something else um, because this, I mean, this theorem used everything in the subject. <laughs> so therefore this did, and I mean, this, this, this theorem I stated at the beginning about vector bundles over even cellular things is also kind of sitting on top of this this pile of theorems that right now are just using everything, everything in the subject to prove. So I wanted to, I wanted to say a little more, indicate something more that goes into this. Um, <clears throat> so I haven't really explained how to prove anything. I've, uh, I've just said we have a way of making a resolution of BGL in terms of these spaces. And so what's so great about those spaces? <clears throat> well, suppose X is even cellular. Then the space of maps, so let me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write SP uh, round brackets X something.
for the um, ah. So for the, the the space, right? This is we're in an infinity category. The, I, there's a there's a con complex or there's a space I can associate a, a space of maps between two objects, and then the pi naught of that space is the thing I've been writing with square brackets. That's the motivic homotopy classes of maps. So this function object, because x is even cellular, that's also a product of copies of um, this the spectrum of the ground field into kz of m to m. Okay, so the cells, the cells don't they don't do anything. Like for example, loop to to L L K Z of N to N is K Z of N minus L to N minus L. <coughs> and so we're trying to compare something, we're trying to compare something to something in topology. And in topology, so we could ask, how does, how does, you know what, I, I, I'm going to call this point. It's our point. So in motivic spaces, maps from a point into k z of n to n, we might hope that this is the same as the eilenberg maclean space k z. 2n, because that's what we were, we were trying to compare. Our, our algebraic churn classes were maps into here. Our topological churn classes were maps into here. And we're trying to compare. We'd, we'd, like, to, we'd like to compare these. <clears throat> so let's do a, a simple example. So k z of 1, 2, that's b gl1 and so that has fundamental group or the global sections of the fundamental group is a uh, so pi 1 of that space that's equal to uh, the unit complex numbers and of course pi 1 of kz2 is zero, <clears throat> um, but that's a kind of a profinite completion problem. If you if you if you did the pro if you took the classifying space of this and you profinitely completed it, you'd get kz two after profinite completion, and that's true for all of these kz of n two n's by Vyvodsky's uh, resolution of the Blockado conjecture. So Vyvodsky tells us. <clears throat> Wojvansky tells us that, all right, so let me just, let me put a hat here for profinite completion. For profinite completion, that that's, um, that that is K, z hat 2n. So that's Vojvodsky's, yeah, that, that's just the block Cato. It's the thing that identifies mod p or mod l motivic cohomology with uh, mod l et al cohomology. So those are the same. And if we use that, we can compare. <clears throat> so by comparing. This resolution BGL and BGLK into I with the topological analog. Which is called the unstable Adams Novikov spectral sequence. Um, comparing it with that. 
you conclude, you get that if x is even cellular, then um, motivic homotopy classes, of, then it's even better the space of motivic homotopy classes of maps this is profinite completion is isomorphic to the space of maps uh, the maps in topology from the underlying analytic space into B, G, L, K, C profinitely completed. So that's close to the theorem we wanted. What we wanted was that vector bundle, I mean, if I hadn't put the completion here, this would be topological vector bundles and this would be algebraic vector bundles. And we have to put the completion there because, um, because it's, it's just wrong. I mean, something, something doesn't line up very well. It's, it, it's just wrong. I mean, x could be a point and k could be one and whatever. <clears throat> okay, so that's, or, or, yeah, but, but this is actually stronger than the statement that we needed. This is something about the whole mapping space and the, state, the theorem I stated about algebraic and topological vector bundles is just a statement about pi zero of this space. So, okay, so, all right. So, so how do we deal with that? Well, again, we apply, we look at this tried and true method of, that Sullivan introduced, the, the arithmetic square, and we look at this, uh, you look at this pullback square, let's see, I don't, so this means the rationalization in terms of Sullivan style localizations, and then we have B, G, L, K, rationalized here, and we have BGL, K, sitting inside the pullback. <clears throat> and we're mapping some affine cellular thing in, and we know at the level of mapping spaces, this is the same as in topology, and we want just homotopy classes of maps here to be the same as in topology, and, uh, and so the problem comes down to understanding this. And I'll just say, so you need to evaluate so in the end, you need to understand well, you need to understand that set of map motivic homotopy classes of maps. <clears throat> And you need to compare it to the, the topological analog. So, and you also need the analog over here at the profinite completion. <clears throat> so now this depends on, on another theorem, an older theorem of, of, uh, of Arj, Arvind Ashok, John Fossil, and myself, that the map BGLK into the product of k z of i to i, i going from 1 to k, is a rational equivalence. And um, that's a, if k was infinity, then that's an, a much older theorem about algebraic K theory and, and, uh, and motivic, co about, it's a much older theorem about algebraic K theory. Uh, the, the, the impact, the, the force here is, the, is this finite K level. And our argument, our argument deduces it, the argument's a little bit indirect. It deduces it, 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 it proves the loop space version of this by proving something about, about GLK or SLK. And uh, anyway, I'm not going to go through it. This is an older, an older result. And um, okay, so with that, then you can use the fact that, uh, <clears throat> you can use the sort of more obvious fact that if X is even cellular, 
then homotopy classes of maps from X into K, Z of, uh, Z of N, 2N is the same as H, 2N of X with integer of the underlying space with integer coefficients. And the same would be true if I replaced Z by Q and then the same, there's some analogous theorem here. And you're just, you're in the right spot of the pullback square to be able to, uh, to analyze these. All right, so I'll stop there. I, uh, I've, I've given talks more recently, I've given a few talks about this theorem more recently, but because this was a motivic homotopy thing, I decided, I hope, I hope that was understandable, I decided to kind of really, really try to give an overview of all the things in motivic homotopy theory that go into proving this. But um, I'll stop there. <coughs>